My name is Richard Owen Overton, World War II veteran, 109 years old. I went to school, I got to 11th grade, and I had to quit. And I uh, kept and take care of my mother, father, my mother and her kids. My father was dead. And I had to stay, take care of her. And her kids were six girls and four boys. And nobody had anything, but I had some hogs, chickens, I had turkeys, and I would sell eggs and butter. Me and my mother would go to town and sit right there on 6th Street and sell that stuff. We'd sell every Saturday we'd go there, make our living there. We bought our home by selling eggs and butter. That's where we made our living there for a while. One Sunday we was at church and we were standing there in a line talking, the bunch talking. And some of the boys said, I wish I had a way to get to West Texas. Where they, where, they, where they was picking cotton. We went out to Big Springs, that's where it was. And, uh, uh, La Mesa and Odessa, all them places. That's where I kept them out there and they picked, went out there. And I cooked while they went out and picked cotton. And, and uh, cotton was, uh, picking cotton was 100 pounds. I mean, say it was a, a, a dollar a hundred. When it got to a dollar and a quarter, I told him, I said, I'm going out there to pick cotton. Because I could pick cotton then. I could pick good cotton, 100 pounds. It wasn't enough for me to pick it one time. I want you to know a little something about Mr. Overton here. He was there at Pearl Harbor when the battleships were still smoldering. He was there at Okinawa. He was there at Iwo Jima, where he said, I only got out of there by the grace of God. At Island Fortress, February. In waters so close to the enemy's homeland, it was no longer possible to capitalize on the element of surprise. Such let you have it, but not being able to see a one of them. Pretty soon you knew for sure they were there. But on February 23rd, 1945, the Marines raised the U.S. flag atop Mount Suribachi. We had to go from island to island. Yeah, we had to get on the ship and go from island to island. And when we go by leaving, going to another island, well, I'd say about four feet, I'd say maybe half a mile, they'd be fighting on that side, but that wasn't our area to fight. We'd just keep on past that like we didn't know. But we had to go from on to our island and get on it. We get that one fought up. And what we go there and there's trees just like this out, some trees out there. Well, we couldn't go in that island, on that tree. Because Japanese would be, it would be five or six Japanese up in that tree. And if you go under that tree, they were going to drop a bomb. See, we'd go in there. We wouldn't go by. I said, we'd go side some here and some here. And we wouldn't, and we wouldn't go in bunches. You had to scout air. So if that airplane didn't come through first and, and scout that tree out, so we could see where the Japs in there now, where they would drop a bomb. See, it would be, be 10 or 12, maybe 30 of us, or 25, and are scattered around differently. But that bomb would not go down. I would not bomb, just bomb down. What he would do, he would come down and say, you scatter. Shoot. All over the place. And that one bomb would kill over 10 or 15 men. That's really, we couldn't go under the tree like those trees out there. We had to wait until the air, three airplanes would go and strip that tree. And then another tree would come on the other side and finish stripping this side. And if it was that wide, it would be another one. When the war ended, do you, do you remember when, when that was? When it ended? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was, we was out in the cotton patch. The other soldiers were making a quantity hut like they make ten top concrete bottoms. 
And I was sitting in the Jeep writing a letter. Well, we, they put everything down what they had right there. They didn't pick it up, they put it down. And got on their cars and come on back to the camp. The war was over. I didn't put my hand on nothing else. The war was over. And we, just me and another fellow was the only one that could come home. Well, we was the oldest. And we was, I was on, take me, I think, three days to get back to land on this side where I was. We had to come in a small ship. They didn't have no big ship to send nobody else, but they need them ships over there and they kept them. They just have a little small ship. If it were one or two people, they had a little small ship to ship them in because we need our ships. We left jeeps on the bank. When the war was over, we give them back, give them to the people. You give, leave over there and they just give them to them. We, we were glad to get away from that place. When the war ended, Richard headed home to Texas to a nation bitterly divided by race, and his service on the battlefield was not always matched by the respect that he deserved at home, but this veteran held his head high. He carried on and lived his life with honor and dignity. He built his wife a house with his own two hands. He went back to work in the furniture business. In time, he served as a courier in the Texas State Capitol, where he worked for four governors and made more friends than most of us do in a lifetime. And today, Richard still lives in the house that he built all those years ago, rakes his own lawn, and every Sunday, he hops in his 1971 Ford truck and drives one of the nice ladies in his neighborhood to church. This is the life of one American veteran living proud and strong in the land he helped keep free. Most people uh, don't believe that you still drive a truck. Yeah, a lot of them don't believe it, yeah. A lot of them don't take a living. Some boys come the other day and say, I'm so proud of you. So I heard you today. I told them, no, I've been living, I'm still living. <laughs> My first cousin, he rode a cab. He come here last week. I was sitting on the porch and he jumped out of the car and come running to the house and said, man, I'm, I ain't tell you this. I said, what? He said, I, they told me you've been dead three or four days ago. I said, I know he couldn't be because I'm his uncle and I didn't hear about it. I said, I don't know who he is, but he's still sitting here now. <laughs> what, what none to me is somebody else. If I was young, I wouldn't be this famous. <laughs>